Hello students, I am putting together a little video for review on the respiratory system chapter. Um, I'm going to try and focus on the physiology, but let's go through uh, some of the basic stuff. Uh, the respiratory system is involved with the exchange of gases between your lungs and the blood and the blood and body cells. In order to achieve that, we have to breathe, which is called ventilation. External respiration is the exchange of oxygen and CO2 with the blood and the lungs, more specifically the alveoli predominantly. And then internal respiration is the exchange of gases between the blood and all the body cells. The body cells need the oxygen to make ATP aerobically. We have to, you know, can't live without oxygen. So the cardiovascular system aids in this process by obviously transporting the respiratory gases around the body. Um, throughout the video, uh, throughout the PowerPoint, you'll notice um, these links I put in. You're probably familiar with them as at, at this point. Uh, make sure you review them. The little animations are are pretty good. The respiratory system is separated into what we call upper and lower respiratory. And we're going to look at those structures in a minute, or at least I'll define what they are. And then we have conducting and respiratory zone structures. <clears throat> conducting zone structures are all of the structures that allow air to enter and leave the lungs, but no gas exchange occurs. And then the respiratory zone structures, which are pretty much the deep structures in the lung, allow for gas exchange, O2 and CO2. The respiratory system is comprised of the areas that we allow air to come in and out of the lungs, which include your nose and your nasal cavity, uh, our pharynx, which is our throat, the trachea, which is your windpipe, which divides into the bronchial tubes. Uh, primary bronchus goes into each lung, a right primary bronchus to the right lung and a left primary bronchus into the left lung, and then those bronchi begin to divide and become smaller. The more they divide, they get smaller and smaller to conduct the air into the deep parts of the lung. The upper respiratory system includes your nose, your pharynx, which basically is your throat, <clears throat> and all of the associated structures there. And the lower respiratory system consist of all structures below your larynx, which is your voice box, uh, and then includes a trachea with all of the branching tubes called the bronchial tubes or the bronchi, and then the lungs themselves. The pharynx, which is what we call our throat, is divided into three regions, an area called the nasopharynx, which includes the structures associated with the back of the nasal cavity, including the uh, auditory tubes, opening of the auditory tube, all the way down to uh, the beginning of the soft palate where the uvula is located, and then the uh, oropharynx, which is typically the back of your throat. <clears throat> you can see that as you look in the mirror and open your mouth, you can see that. And then below uh, the epiglottis, which is a broad piece of cartilage that prevents food and drink from going into your windpipe, down to and just at the area of the opening of the trachea, which is called the remiglottidus. So that's called the laryngopharynx. So there's three parts to our, our pharynx. The larynx itself is a box of cartilage, includes the anterior cartilage that we call our Adam's apple, it's called the thyroid cartilage. Uh, it's a, the, one of the three single cartilages making up our voice box. It forms the anterior wall of the voice box. The posterior part of our wall of our voice box is predominantly uh, produced by uh, the cricoid cartilage, which we see here. And then the epiglottis is a broad leaf-shaped piece of cartilage that closes over the opening of your trachea as you swallow food and drink. 
Here is a, a diagram showing a cross section through the cervical region uh, where we see the opening of the trachea right here. It lies anterior to your esophagus, which is the little muscular collapsible tube that lies behind the trachea. This is the tube that we swallow food and drink through. As far as the bronchi are concerned, uh, the trachea will divide into what we call two main primary bronchi, a uh, right one and a left one. The primary bronchi subdivide into secondary bronchi, which are also called lober bronchi. The lober bronchi, or secondary bronchi, supply each lobe of the lung. And if you notice, the right lung has three lobes, one superior lobe, two middle lobe, three inferior lobe. So the right lung has three lober bronchi. The left lung only has two lobes, superior and inferior lobes. So the left lung has two lober bronchi. From that point, the secondary bronchi subdivide into what we call segmental bronchi. They're also referred to as tertiary bronchi that then subdivide into yet smaller tubes called the bronchioles and then down to the terminal bronchioles. <clears throat> so here again is the breakdown of the bronchi, the trachea to the primary bronchi, the secondary bronchi, also called lober, tertiary bronchi called segmental bronchi, bronchioles and terminal bronchioles. Now, all the way from your nose, when you breathe in through your nose, through your nasal cavity, through the pharynx, it goes through the pharynx, into the trachea, all the way down to the terminal bronchioles, there's no gas exchange whatsoever. So all of those structures are referred to as conducting zone structures. Below the terminal bronchioles, those branches, uh, which include um, the respiratory bronchioles, will begin the respiratory zone structures. So as far as the conducting zone structures are concerned, you can see I listed them out here. You need to know that these structures only conduct air in and out of the lungs. They don't allow for gas exchange to occur whatsoever. When you're reviewing your PowerPoint, make sure you, you review that. Um, as far as the anatomy of the lung, just know that the right lung has three lobes separated by fissures. You can see there's a horizontal fissure that separates the superior lobe from the middle lobe. And then what we call an oblique fissure, the right oblique fissure separating the middle lobe from the inferior lobe. Since the left lung only has two lobes, there's only one fissure. And since it runs at uh, a, an angle, a 45 degree angle like this, is called an oblique fissure, similar to the one on the right uh, lung that we see over here. Whoops, sorry about that. All right, now the alveoli. The alveoli are the primary respiratory zone structures. The respiratory zone structures are listed here. So just let's go back a little bit. And we can see that the conducting zone structures terminate at what we call a terminal bronchiole. Branches from these terminal bronchioles are called respiratory bronchioles. The respiratory bronchioles divide into alveolar ducts that we see here. Uh, alveolar sacs and then down to the alveoli which is where the majority of the gas exchange occurs. Here's a diagram that shows the terminal bronchiole and then the subsequent respiratory bronchioles that will branch down from that. So from the respiratory bronchioles down all the way to the alveolar sac and the alveoli is where the gas exchange occurs. All of this is microscopic, very, very microscopic. So it's deep in the lungs where we have our gas exchange. Here's a cross-section diagram of an alveolus, uh, and in the alveolus there are a few things that we need to make note of. Of course, on the test, I'm not going to put a picture of this for identification in the lecture, but nonetheless, the alveolus is this, what in the layman's terms, called the air sac, made up of principally a, a couple of different types of cells, something called a type 1 alveolar cell. This is a simple squamous cell that you learned about in AMP1. It forms the wall of the alveolus. We also have a type 2 cell, type 2 alveolar cell called a septal cell. The septal cell or type 2 alveolar cell produces a uh, secretory product called surfactant, which prevents the alveoli from collapsing down on themselves after we exhale. 
um, by reducing the surface tension of the water on the inside of the alveolus. We also have something called a dust cell, which basically is a, a cuboidal cell. It's called, I mean, I'm sorry, it's a, a macrophage, a wandering macrophage called an alveolar macrophage, and it goes around and phagocytizes dirt and debris that we breathe up into uh, our lung. Now we're about to look at also the respiratory membrane. <clears throat> the respiratory membrane includes all of the layers. You see a little capillary here on the outside of the alveolar wall. It includes all the layers that the gases have to be transported through, which includes the type 1 alveolar cell itself. The gases have to go through that cell and then the basement membrane for the alveolar cell and the capillary, the gases go through that and then through the endothelial cell of the capillary. So oxygen is going to be loaded into the blood from the alveolus and uh, CO2 is going to be transported out of the blood into the alveolus so we can exhale that out. This is what we call external respiration, which we're going to get to in a minute. So here are the respiratory membrane structures. Just know them, I listed them in order that they occur um, from the inside of the lung down to the inside of the capillary. That's the order in which I listed them in. So just know those layers that make up the respiratory membrane. As far as the blood entering the lung, um, we should remember that the pulmonary system is composed of arteries carrying deoxygenated blood the venule system in the pulmonary system carries oxygenated blood so from the right ventricle blood is going to be pumped through the pulmonary trunk into pulmonary arteries and the pulmonary arteries supply blood directly into the lungs they then branch down to smaller arteries bronchial arteries and then what we call the pulmonary arterioles uh, where the majority of gas exchange will occur at the alveolar capillaries Blood's going to leave the lung via the pulmonary vein, venule system. So we have smaller veins called venules that then exit the lung as two principal pulmonary veins that then returns that oxygenated blood back to the left atrium so that it can go to the left ventricle and the left ventricle will then pump the blood back out to the body, the freshly oxygenated blood to all the cells in the body. Now this ventilation perfusion coupling is something of interest because what this is is a way that our body sends more blood to an area of the lung that is more ventilated. So if we have an area of the lung where um, we don't have as much uh, ventilation, blood will be rerouted away from that area to another area that's more ventilated. So we get vasoconstriction and to uh, in response to hypoxia which is low oxygen which will divert the blood from where we don't have much ventilation to the areas where we do have ventilation this is opposite to what happens out in the body in a systemic circuit when we have hypoxia occurring in a systemic circuit the vessels vasodilate to try and increase blood flow to the to the tissue it's just the opposite in the lung now I'll put in here some tables. I want you to review the structures, um, you know, the epithelial changes that occur uh, down the different structures, um, and just their overall special features, what happens in those structures. And so let's talk about pulmonary ventilation. Pulmonary ven ventilation basically is breathing. So I don't know if you ever thought about how we actually get air to move into and then out of the lungs, you know, through our mouth and nose, down the windpipe trachea, to in and out of the lungs. Well, air can only move down a pressure gradient. <clears throat> so we have to manipulate uh, the pressure inside of our lung, the intrapulmonic pressure, and in which case, if we can decrease the pressure in the lung, below atmospheric pressure. Atmospheric pressure is 760 millimeters of mercury of pressure. So we would have to decrease the pressure in our lungs in order to cause air to go from the atmosphere into the lungs because we can't change atmospheric pressure. 
We can change the pressure in our lungs, though, and I'm going I'm to tell you how we do that in a minute. And in order to exhale, to get air to go back out, we have to increase the pressure in the lung just above 760. And here they show 762. So by increasing the pressure in the lung above atmospheric pressure, the air will then move out of the lungs and your system back to the, to the atmosphere. So we actually increase or decrease the pressure in the lung above or below atmospheric pressure to cause expiration or inspiration respectively. So we're going to talk about that a little bit in a second. Um, let's see, in pulmonary ventilation, air is going to move between the atmosphere and the alveoli. That's basically breathing. So when air moves into the lungs, it's called inhalation. When air moves out of the lungs, it's called exhalation. And ultimately, we have to have certain skeletal muscles contract and then relax in order to change the pressures in the lungs, which will cause inhalation and exhalation. Those muscles that manipulate the pressures in the lungs when they contract and relax are called respiratory muscles. All right, now, this is just a little summary slide I put in here. Air moves into the lungs when the pressure in the lungs is less than atmospheric pressure. So remember, we can't change atmospheric pressure, but if we can lower the pressure on the inside of the lungs below atmospheric pressure, then the air will move into the lungs. Again, air is going to move down a pressure gradient. Um, in order to exhale, the pressure in the lung has to rise higher or become greater than atmospheric pressure in which case the air will move from the lungs where the pressure is higher to the atmosphere where the pressure is lower. So let's talk about how we decrease pressure to inhale or increase pressure in the lung to exhale. It really deals with something called Boyle's Law. So we're going to learn about a couple of gas laws here. Uh, we're going to do Boyle's Law first. Boyle's Law is an inverse proportion with respect to the volume of a, a container and the pressure of the gas in the container. So what that means is, is as the volume of a container decreases, the pressure of the gas in the container would increase. On the other hand, if the volume of the container increases, the pressure of the gas in the container would decrease. So that's what this little picture is trying to demonstrate. Here's a larger volume and the pressure, you see the pressure gauge shows one. If we decrease the volume of that container, the pressure increases. So the, 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 the container that we're really talking about here obviously are the lungs. So as we increase or decrease the volume of our lungs, we then manipulate the pressure in the lungs. So we have to talk about how we do that. How do we increase lung volume and thus decrease its pressure? How do we decrease lung volume and thus increase the pressure in the lung? And by doing that, we would inhale or exhale, as mentioned earlier. So here's a diagram showing the muscles. We learned most of these in AMP1. Uh, you're, you have inspiratory muscles that allow inhalation to occur. You have expiratory muscles which would cause what we call a forced expiration, which I'm going to talk about. So we have two principal inspiratory muscles, the diaphragm, which is the one that probably most of you know about, and then muscles between our ribs called the external intercostal muscles. Inspiration, or to inhale, always requires skeletal muscle contraction, which is an active process. So muscles have to contract always in order for us to inhale. So the diaphragm would contract, the external intercostal muscles will contract, and by contracting these muscles, we actually increase thoracic volume, which increases lung volume, and we would decrease the pressure in the lung, and then we would inhale. On the other hand, in order to exhale, we don't necessarily have to contract muscles. All we have to do is just relax the inspiratory muscles that we contracted. <clears throat> And by doing that, it would decrease lung volume, uh, thoracic volume, which would decrease lung volume, and increase the pressure in the lung, and thus cause air to move out, which we call exhalation or expiration.
So the muscles on this side over here, which refer to, uh, which are referred to as the expiratory muscles, are muscles that we can contract if we want to have a forced expiration. So if you are running on a treadmill and you are breathing in very deeply and breathing out very deeply, that will require accessory muscles to contract and relax to increase and decrease the volumes of our lung even more than normal that will change the pressure gradient to allow more air to enter or leave the lungs. So for instance, when you're breathing in deeply, we have accessory muscles of, con of inhalation or inspiration, which includes muscles you might recognize, the sternocleidomastoid, the scalenes, and a muscle that's not on here, the pectoralis minor muscle. Those muscles contract and increase thoracic cavity volume even more than normal, which decreases lung volume even more than normal, which allows more air to enter the lung as we breathe in. The expiratory muscles, when they contract, they typically just decrease thoracic cavity volume a lot more than normal, which increases the pressure in the lung more than normal. And if you increase the pressure in the lungs more than normal during what we call normal quiet breathing, you're going to exhale more air out. And that allows for deeper inhalation and exhalation. Um, here I just want you to know some definitions concerning breathing. So make sure you know that. Eupnea is normal breathing. Apnea, you might, you might have heard of sleep apnea. Apnea is where we temporarily stop breathing. Dyspnea is difficult breathing. Tachypnea is rapid breathing. And then coastal breathing and diaphragmatic breathing are uh, labored type breathing events, which can be observed on your patient. A coastal breathing event is where you see the rib cage bounding outward as the patient is laying there. Uh, the, the rib cage moves up and down a lot more than normal. And in diaphragmatic breathing, the diaphragm contracts harder than normal, so the, the abdomen rises more than normal during that breathing event. Now let's talk about oxygen and carbon dioxide exchange and how we're going to transport these gases. There's another gas law called Dalton's law. And Dalton's law uh, talks about the fact that a gas that is made up of multiple different types of gases, like our atmospheric air, has more than just oxygen in it. There's water vapor, there's oxygen and nitrogen, nitrogen being the most concentrated gas in the, the atmospheric air. We have oxygen, some CO2, some nitrogen, and some water vapor. All of that's in the air. So Dalton uh, came up with a, a way to calculate the individual pressure of a gas and a mixed gas. So I just said earlier that the atmospheric pressure, and I didn't say it was at sea level, it is at sea level. The atmospheric pressure at sea level is 760 millimeters of mercury of pressure. However, since that atmospheric air is made up of oxygen and CO2, nitrogen, and water, <clears throat> excuse me, what amount of this 760 millimeters of mercury of pressure is attributed to oxygen or to CO2 or to nitrogen or to water? So this brings up the concept of what we call a partial pressure. And we, we're going to have to know what the partial pressure of the gases are so we know where the gases are going to move in the body. Because the gases can only ever move down a pressure gradient. Just like atmospheric air can only move down a pressure gradient, so can the individual gases move from point A to point B down their own pr partial pressure gradient. So if we know the percentage of the gas in a mixed gas, for instance, oxygen is about 21 percent. You don't have to know the, the actual percentage, but let's say it's 21 percent. Um, make it easy, we could say 20 percent. But it, all you have to do is take the percentage of the total pressure of the gas and you end up with the individual pressure of the gas. And if we add up all of the individual partial pressures of the gases, you then come up with the total pressure of the gas. In this case at sea level it's 760 millimeters of mercury of pressure. So in our body, we're, as when we're talking about gas exchange with, with regards to oxygen and CO2, we're not going to be dealing with 
with these numbers, we're going to be dealing with some other numbers. So we're going to look at that in a minute. And that's going to deal with internal and external respiration uh, to determine which direction the gases will move. So external respiration is nothing more than the exchange of oxygen and CO2 with the blood and the alveoli in the lungs. So you're exchanging O2 for CO2. You load the blood with oxygen. You remove CO2 from the blood at the alveoli, and that's called external respiration. Internal respiration is the exchange of oxygen and CO2 from the blood to the body cells and all the tissues in the body. And in this case, the CO2 is going to move from the tissue cell into the blood, and oxygen is going to move from the blood into the body cell that needs it to make ATP aerobically. A couple little uh, links I want you to check out for gas exchange. And here's what it looks like very generically. The top part of this picture represents external respiration. Here's the, uh, the alveoli up here, the alveolar sac. So, of course, we want oxygen to go from freshly inhaled air into the blood, and we want the CO2 to leave the blood to go into the alveoli so we can exhale it out. That's called external respiration. Internal respiration is where the oxygen moves from the blood into the cell so the cell can use it, and the cell then produces CO2 as a waste product of aerobic respiration and that CO2 is going to then move into the blood so we can ultimately exhale it out. All right. So as far as the gases being transported in the blood, we need to know how they're transported. Oxygen is, is the simplest case um, because we learned about hemoglobin in the blood chapter already. Only about 1.5% of all the oxygen that is loaded in the blood at external respiration is transported dissolved in plasma. So some of that stays dissolved in plasma, but you notice it's not a whole, it's not a lot, not a big number, because oxygen does not like to stay dissolved in water. So the majority of the oxygen goes from the plasma as it's entering the blood into the red blood cell where it binds to the iron on the heme group of hemoglobin. So hemoglobin is going to transport about 98.5% of the oxygen carried in the blood. CO2 is transported in the blood in three ways. As the CO2 enters the blood at internal respiration from all the body cells, about 7% stays dissolved in plasma. 23% actually combines with hemoglobin, in which case when hemoglobin is bound to, with CO2, it's called carbaminohemoglobin. So about 23% is actually transported on hemoglobin, although it's not transported on the heme group. The majority of all the CO2, though, is converted into bicarbonate. About 75, per, uh, I'm sorry, 70% of the CO2 is converted into bicarbonate, which, which is HCO3. And that should be, it's an anion. It should, it should have a negative, negative charge right here. So it should be HCO3 minus, because bicarbonate is a, anion. Again, watch these animations. It's going to help you out. So here's our picture again showing external respiration at the top, internal respiration at the bottom. Here they show CO2 is going to be leaving. 70% is going to leave as bicarbonate is converted back down to CO2. I know they show it leaving directly like this but that bicarbonate re-enters the red blood cell and is converted back to CO2. Um, and I'll, I'll talk about that later, and if I don't uh, get to that, I'll try and post something else on that uh, chemical reaction. Uh, CO2 bound to hemoglobin leaves hemoglobin, so it leaves about 23%. And then there was only about 7% dissolved in the plasma, so it leaves, gets into the alveoli, and we, we're going to exhale that out. About 1.5% of oxygen as it's loaded in the blood just stays dissolved in the blood, plasma, and the rest of it, 98.5% or so, goes directly into the red blood cell where it binds to hemoglobin and is transported on hemoglobin. Down here at internal respiration, the oxygen will diffuse either from the plasma and or from the hemoglobin to get into uh, the body cell, <clears throat> and the CO2 is going to then enter the blood. 7% stays dissolved in the plasma, 
23% binds a hemoglobin, and 70% is converted into bicarbonate. Now, once we have oxygen loaded in the blood, it's being predominantly transported by hemoglobin. <clears throat> We're ultimately going to have to get that oxygen to be unloaded from hemoglobin so the body cells can use it. So when two molecules are attracted to each other to bind together, it's what we call affinity. So the affinity or the attractiveness of hemoglobin to oxygen, that is how much will it like to bind to hemoglobin, depends on several different factors. It depends on how much oxygen we have, which this is called the partial pressure of oxygen, what the pH is, what the temperature is, um, the amount of an intermediate from glycolysis, which is referred to as bisphosphoglycerate, how much of that we have, and then the type of hemoglobin, because we have adult hemoglobin and we have fetal hemoglobin that we have to talk about. Okay, so we have to discuss these dissociation curves. So what we're looking at here in the next couple slides are some curves <clears throat> that represent the amount of oxygen that is saturated or bound to hemoglobin. So we can see that over here. You can see the percent saturation of hemoglobin up to between 90 and 100 percent on this side. And then the partial pressure of oxygen down here at the bottom. So if we look at this uh, curve in the middle, this is called uh, a standardized curve. And what that means is is that it's a, a whole bunch of sets of data had been collected so that we know at any partial pressure of oxygen the actual saturation of oxygen on hemoglobin. For instance, you notice down here if oxygen is at uh, 100 millimeters of mercury of pressure in the blood, which is typical of freshly oxygenated arterial blood, about 100 millimeters of, of mercury of pressure. <clears throat> if we read up to the curve, we then would see what the percent saturation of oxygen is to hemoglobin, which is right about 100%. Actually, it might be a little less, but let's just say 100 to make it easy. But then if we notice these other lines that go up to our curve, 40 millimeters of mercury of pressure in deoxygenated blood, blood that has left the tissue already and the cells took out the oxygen they need, the oxygen saturation, or I'm sorry, the partial pressure of oxygen in that blood is about 40 millimeters of mercury of pressure. So this is just your deoxygenated blood at rest, not somebody running on a treadmill, but them just sitting down, not using their muscles, or relaxing what we call deoxygenated blood, the blood has about 40 millimeters of mercury or pressure of oxygen in it. So if we read up to the standardized curve, we'll notice then even what we call deoxygenated blood still is saturated with oxygen up to 75%. <clears throat> so what that means is, is the blood that's already gone through a tissue and then we would, and the cells took out the oxygen it needs and we call that blood deoxygenated, it actually is still saturated at 75% with oxygen, which means at rest, the cells only are pulling out of the blood 25%, 25% of the oxygen that we were transporting at rest. But notice this other curve, really between 20 and 30 millimeters of mercury of pressure is the pressure of uh, partial pressure of oxygen in blood if we're vigorously working out. So if you're vigorously working out and you're sending that more oxygenated blood to your muscles, your muscles are going to remove more oxygen they, that they need because they're working out and the partial pressure drops. And if we read up to the curve then, you can see then at vigorously working out the what we call deoxygenated blood is now saturated at about 35%. So I can actually get two pieces of information off of this chart. I can see directly that the deoxygenated blood, if I'm working out uh, vigorously, I, my blood, my red blood cells, hemoglobin, is still only saturate, is saturated at 35%. But indirectly, what I can see 
is that from 35% up to 100 is the amount of oxygen that actually went to the muscles that are working out anyway. <clears throat> so about 65% of oxygen was removed from hemoglobin if we're vigorously working out. So here's the question. What causes more oxygen to be unloaded from hemoglobin if you're vigorously working out relative to if you're just sitting down? If you're just sitting down and you're not using your muscles, your partial pressure of oxygen is 40. And if we look at how much is still saturated, it's saturated at 75%. So what caused this extra oxygen to be unloaded from hemoglobin if we're vigorously working out? And that's what we actually are getting into the factors that are affecting how strongly attracted hemoglobin is to oxygen or what we call its affinity. So the, the factors that affect the affinity of hemoglobin for oxygen changes when chemical conditions change. Physical parameters and chemical conditions change. So let's look at some of that. The first condition that you see right here deals with pH. You see three little curves here. The one in the middle, the black one, shows a normal blood pH of 7.4. The blue one shows a pH of 7.6, which is alkaline. This is a fairly severe alkalosis. And then the red line, which is shifted to the right, shows an acidic pH, 7.2. And this is severe acidosis. These are outlying uh, severe uh, cases to show the shift of a curve. So ultimately, if we are moderately working out and the pH is kind of normal and we see the curve in the middle, if we read up from this partial pressure of 30 up to the curve, you see we're saturated about 50%. So if we're moderately working out and the pH is normal, then our hemoglobin holds on to 50% of its oxygen, but it liberates or lets go of 50%. Whoops, sorry about that. Uh, it liberates about 50% to the cells that need it. So if I read over right here, we're, you know, right at 50%. Now, look what happens even at that same partial pressure if the pH of the blood changes. If the pH of the blood becomes acidic, we see a right-handed shift of this curve. <clears throat> and ultimately, when you're vigorously working out, the pH may change and will cause a little shift of the curve. It won't be this drastic because your pH won't drop to 7.2, but we'll, it will become a little more acidic. So in an acidic environment, here's the key. In an acidic environment, hemoglobin's affinity for oxygen decreases. So look at the curve. Reading up from the same partial pressure, if we read up to the curve where the the pH is, is acidic, you can see we're only saturated at about, well, just above 35%. So let's just say 35% to make it easy. Um, so hemoglobin is saturated for, at 35%. But that means then that hemoglobin let go of 65% to get to the cells. So in an acidic environment, hemoglobin lets go of more oxygen. So what that means is, in an acidic environment, the affinity of hemoglobin for oxygen goes down. The opposite is true if the pH rises and the blood becomes alkaline. There's a left-handed shift of the curve. In a left-handed shift of the curve, if we read up, you can see at that same partial pressure of oxygen, hemoglobin is saturated at 65%, and it only lets go of... 35%, which means at an alkaline condition or a high pH, the affinity of hemoglobin for oxygen actually goes up. It likes to hold on to oxygen more strongly in an alkaline environment. It's just the opposite in a, a low pH environment. Hemoglobin's affinity goes down and dissociation of oxygen increases from hemoglobin. The same holds true if we consider the partial pressure of CO2. How much CO2 is in the blood means something. So our normal amount of CO2 is represented by the black curve. If we have too much CO2 in the blood, 
as when you first start working out vigorously, the CO2 starts to build up. Then you see a right-handed shift of the curve. And in a low PCO2 environment, we have a left-handed shift of the curve. So it looks very similar to the pH condition. In fact, they're, they're very much related. So <clears throat> ultimately, if you're vigorously working out, we read up, the amount of CO2 starts to build up. The, the muscle cells are making more CO2. And we see that, that hemoglobin is only saturated at right about 35%, which means when CO2 levels get high, the affinity for hemoglobin to oxygen goes down and the dissociation of oxygen from hemoglobin goes up. So hemoglobin actually let go of 65% in a high PCO2 environment. In a low PCO2 environment, um, the affinity of hemoglobin for oxygen actually increases, which means it holds on to more oxygen and less oxygen dissociates from the hemoglobin. So you can see these, these chemical parameters actually change how strongly hemoglobin is attracted to oxygen. So again, in the conditions that decrease hemoglobin's affinity for oxygen, as in low blood pH or high PCO2, the dissociation of oxygen from hemoglobin increases. And in conditions where the affinity of hemoglobin to oxygen increases, as in high pH or low PCO2, the dissociation of oxygen from hemoglobin actually decreases. So it's an inverse. Anything that causes affinity of hemoglobin for oxygen to increase decreases dissociation of oxygen. And anything that decreases the affinity of hemoglobin for oxygen increases the dissociation of oxygen from the hemoglobin molecule. <coughs> Excuse me. So here is another parameter. It's not a chemical parameter, but it's a physical parameter. Our temperature, our body temperature. In the very middle, you see our normal body temperature, 37 degrees C or 98.6 uh, degrees Fahrenheit. And of course, the outlying curves were pretty, you wouldn't be living, but they show a drastic change so that we could see a separation in the curve because the curves actually separate very slowly. So you can see then if we read up from any one of these partial pressures, say from a partial pressure of 30 up to our normal body temperature, then we only are saturated at about 50%. So this is when we're working out. If you're at rest, we read up from 40, it should be right around 70 to 75%, which it in this curve kind of shows that. So <clears throat> our normal uh, body temperature would show the normal distribution and transport of, of oxygen on hemoglobin and thus its dissociation uh, to the cells in the body. So if we look at the same partial pressure, let's say 30, and our body temperature is high, you see that we hit the curve and hemoglobin's affinity for oxygen actually goes down drastically because at a high temperature, at that partial pressure, hemoglobin's only saturated at just above 20%, which means more oxygen, about 80%, dissociated from hemoglobin. So when we get hot, hemoglobin lets go of more oxygen, which is different from if we are cold. Body temperature goes down, you read all the way up to that chart, that curve, you can see that the affinity for hemoglobin goes up because hemoglobin is still saturated with 80% or so of oxygen and it only lets go of about 20%. So as the temperature rises, the affinity of hemoglobin for oxygen goes down and thus we increase dissociation of oxygen. As the temperature decreases, the affinity of, of hemoglobin for oxygen goes, goes up and we decrease the dissociation of oxygen from hemoglobin. We then deal with also fetal and maternal hemoglobin. As it turns out, fetal hemoglobin is a little different from maternal hemoglobin or what we call adult hemoglobin. And <clears throat> the differences there actually include the ability of hemoglobin to bind to, oh, I'm sorry, has the ability to bind to bisphosphoglycerate. So fetal hemoglobin actually binds less BPG than maternal hemoglobin does. If hemoglobin has more BPG bound to it, 
the affinity of hemoglobin for oxygen goes down and thus dissociation goes up. So since fetal hemoglobin does not like to bind to BPG, it has a higher affinity for oxygen. So the oxygen is more strongly attracted from the mom's blood, the maternal blood, across the placenta to the fetal blood. And that way the fetus can receive a good bit of oxygen. So that deals with bisphosphoglycerate. Fetal hemoglobin does not like to bind to BPG, which increases hemoglobin's affinity for oxygen, whereas adult hemoglobin can bind BPG more strongly and thus decrease its affinity for oxygen and thus increase oxygen dissociation from hemoglobin, which can go to the cells that need it. All right, so let's look at this chemistry I was referring to before. We have to learn the carbonic acid cycle. So if you haven't looked at this yet, which you should have already, but if not, we need to, we need to consider uh, the chemistry here. So the top picture um, represents the external respiration, the exchange of gases between the blood and uh, the alveoli of the lung. The bottom picture represents the exchange of gases between the blood and the body cells. So let's start down here with um, external, uh, internal respiration. Here's the body cell. The body cells are constantly making CO2 as a waste product of aerobic respiration. And so CO2 is going to diffuse from the cell through the extracellular fluid. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm sorry. The CO2 is going to diffuse from the body cells into the extracellular fluid across the capillary wall into the plasma. Now, there's three fates of this CO2. They don't show one of them, but some of the CO2, about 7% of the CO2, will just stay dissolved in the plasma and will flow with the blood through the plasma. 93%, the rest of it, of the CO2, actually enters the red blood cell. 23% of that 93% is going to bind to hemoglobin which we call carbamine and hemoglobin and they show that right here as co2 binds the hemoglobin and now this hemoglobin bound co2 is called carbamine and hemoglobin 70 percent of that 93 percent so the rest of the co2 is going to enter into this chemical reaction co2 is going to bind with water in the presence of carbonic anhydrase to form carbonic acid, which is H2CO3. And that acid uh, dissociates into bicarbonate, which is HCO3 minus, it's an anion, and hydrogen ion, which is a cation. The hydrogen, which is basically acid, binds to hemoglobin and makes the hemoglobin acidic. And if you remember our dissociation chart earlier, Acid environments cause oxygen to dissociate more freely from hemoglobin because in an acid environment, the affinity of hemoglobin for oxygen goes down. So this reaction actually helps promote oxygen dissociation that then can go into the cell that needs it to do work. I mean, I'm sorry, that's doing work. They need it to perform aerobic respiration to make ATP. The bicarbonate that is being made is actually going to leave the red blood cell. It actually does, throw, does so through an exchanger that they're not showing on the picture. But as we lose a bicarbonate right here, a chloride also is exchanged and it enters the red blood cell. So for one bicarbonate leaving, one chloride enters the red blood cell. This is called the chloride shift. Now these ions don't move across the plasma membrane directly. They actually move through an exchanger, which is not being shown. It's basically a transporter. So let's look at, now we are transporting CO2 in the blood, 7% dissolved in the plasma, 23% bound to hemoglobin, and 70% in a form of bicarbonate that is now flowing in plasma. Look what happens at external respiration. When you breathe in, you want the oxygen to be loaded into the blood. So oxygen will go from the lungs into the blood where some of it will stay dissolved in plasma, only about 1.5% or so. 
actually enters the red blood cell. And in a high partial pressure environment, the hemoglobin lets go of the hydrogen ion that was bound to it. So now oxygen binds to hemoglobin, which kicks the, the hydrogen off. The bicarbonate re-enters the red blood cell in exchange for a chloride leaving. This is called a reversal of the chloride shift. One bicarbonate enters, one chloride leaves, and that's a reversal of the original chloride shift that we saw at internal respiration. So when the bicarbonate enters the red blood cell, it combines with the hydrogen that was removed from hemoglobin. It reforms carbonic acid, which is dissociated back down to CO2 and water with the activity of this enzyme, carbonic anhydrase. During that time, we also have CO2 that is going to be going down its partial pressure gradient. Um, so it's going to be removed from hemoglobin and go into the lungs, and we're going to exhale that out. So this is the chemistry behind how the gases are exchanged. If you have any questions about that, you can just send me an email on that, and I will try and answer them as quickly as possible. Now, let's talk about the control of respiration a little bit. We have cortical influences on uh, controlling how we breathe, our breathing patterns. That is uh, your cerebral cortex is what I'm referring to. And so you basically can say, I want to hold my breath. And you hold your breath. Or you can hyperventilate. You can breathe faster than normal. So while you're conscious, you have control over that. Um, but we also have receptors that uh, will have inputs into what we call our respiratory centers in our medulla and in our brain, in the brainstem. So chemoreceptors actually monitor the chemistry of our blood and or the, the chemistry of cerebrospinal fluid. There are chemoreceptors in the central nervous system in the brainstem. They're called central chemoreceptors. They monitor CO2 and pH predominantly. Uh, peripheral chemoreceptors, which are found in large blood vessels like your aortic, aorta, like the aortic arch, and your carotid arteries at the base of them, uh, actually monitor how much oxygen is in the blood, how much CO2 is in the blood, and pH. So you need to uh, watch, uh, you know, the little animation on the regulation of ventilation. Um, but let's talk about these conditions. So the chemoreceptors are monitoring chemical changes in our blood. So let's talk about that for a second. When someone starts to work out running on a treadmill, they're going to breathe deeper and faster. That's pretty much common sense. But what causes that to happen? Well, in part, chemical changes in the blood occur when tissues become metabolically active. So when tissues are metabolically active, they produce more CO2 than if the, the tissues are not metabolically active. And that is due to the fact that the cells that are active are producing more ATP aerobically. So by performing more ATP aerobically, you give off more CO2 as a, as a byproduct. So when the blood has more CO2 in it than at rest, when someone's resting, it's called hypercapnia. Um, hypercapnia is going to cause an increase in our respiratory rate. When we have cells that are metabolically active, they use more oxygen than when we're at rest, so they remove more oxygen from the blood, which induces a local hypoxic event. So as the, as the tissue starts to decrease its oxygen load, which is called hypoxia, that's going to stimulate the respiratory centers to cause an increase in our respiratory rate as well so we can load the blood faster with oxygen. And then we come to uh, pH. When tissues are act, uh, metabolically active, they produce more acids than bases. Some of those acids actually come from a large amount of CO2, and then there's some organic acids like the one that most people are familiar with when you work out called lactic acid. So at either rate, in a metabolically active tissue, the pH locally around the tissue may start to drop. Well, we learned earlier that 
uh, in an acidosis state, at least the hemoglobin's affinity for oxygen decreases, which means more oxygen can be dissociated from hemoglobin so that the cells can use it. But here we also have a low pH uh, event that actually is going to help increase our respiratory rate. So the conditions that stimulate the respiratory center in your brainstem to increase your respiratory rate are increased CO2, low oxygen, and low pH or acidosis. So you can see the regulation dealing with pH and some of the other things there. So here's a little uh, negative feedback loop. I want you guys to review this uh, concerning the uh, chemoreceptors I was just referring to. Uh, the chemoreceptors are going to monitor the chemistry either in the blood or in cerebrospinal fluid. Now, our controlled condition in this, in this particular case is uh, the amount of CO2 that is in the blood and what the blood pH is and how much oxygen we have in the blood. So, if we are vigorously working out, running on a treadmill, the stresses by the cells removing uh, oxygen and producing more CO2 actually causes an increase in how much CO2 is into the blood, gets into the blood. So if your muscles work out harder than normal, they're going to make more CO2, so your CO2 levels go up. But they will also uh, produce more acid, so the pH drops, and they will remove more oxygen. So when the CO2 is high, pH is low, or oxygen is low, the chemoreceptors in the central nervous system and in the peripheral nervous system fire nerve impulses to the respiratory center. The respiratory centers are found in the medulla oblongata, and here specifically we have something called the dorsal respiratory group. There also is something called the ventral respiratory group. Um, these two groups work, well, the, the DRG causes for normal uh, ventilation changes, and the VRG will cause you to breathe in deeper and harder if you're working out. But nonetheless, the dorsal respiratory group will send nerve impulses to your inspiratory muscles, the muscles of in inhalation, and to your uh, ex expiratory muscles, the muscles for exhalation. So these muscles contract more vigorously, uh, faster than normal, uh, which means you're going to hyperventilate a little bit. And so by breathing in uh, more than normal, you're going to remove more CO2 from the blood, and you're going to uh, increase the blood pH and you're going to increase your oxygen load. So when you're breathing faster than normal at rest, you, you correct the original condition that changed, and once your blood chemistry goes back to normal, your, the, the negative feedback loop stops, and you uh, just go back to your normal way of breathing. So that changes when we're working out, uh, and our chemistry changes in our blood. All right, now, um, as far as a summary of the stimuli that affect the breathing rates, this is a little bit about what I was talking about before. Just look at, uh, you know, that what causes an increase or a decrease in the rate and depth of breathing, these conditions that you see here, um, and just be familiar with them. All right, that's the end of the slideshow. So if you have any questions, just send me an email, and I'll be happy to answer them.